Dr. Marianne Small, the former Dean of Education at the University of New Brunswick, writes and speaks about math across the country to teachers, administrators, and parents. She has written close to 90 books for teachers of K-12 students and many additional resources for ministries of education, including our Ministry of uh, uh, Education in Ontario. So after the briefest bio I have ever done, I would like to invite Dr. Marion Small to come up and talk to us. Okay, he advanced my slides, I'll put them back. Um, I'm just going to tell you now that you are getting, I'm going to flip through a few slides and not do it, don't panic. I, I'm a little shorter in time than I thought I was, so don't worry. Um, my focus today is on two pieces. One is, oh, I'm getting echoes. Um, how the, oh, the door, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um, how the teaching of math has changed or has not changed in schools, which for, for your kids but also what role you could play at home that would help your kids do better in math. Um, there will be time, a little bit of time for questions at the end. If you have questions in the middle, you can ask as well. Um, there are, for, how many of you are elementary school parents? Like your kids are in elementary, how many high school? Okay, so you're mixed. In the elementary schools in Ontario, parents uh, will receive report cards that talk about five strands in math. It's a little bit different in high schools. Um, Ontario is, by the way, the only province that reports on five strands in math, um, but all provinces teach them. Um, the one that most parents are focused on is number. So I'll talk mostly about number, but kids do other strands. Um, they include geometry and measurement and pattern and algebra and data management. Um, and I just realized I forgot to tell you that I actually have posted this whole presentation on my website. Um, I'll give you a link and you don't have to write anything down if you don't want to. Um, so because number is the thing that parents ask me about the most, that's the one I'll talk about. Um, in the media, and I have definitely been part of stories and read, um, there is lots of discussion about different aspects of how math has and hasn't changed. One of the things that gets talked about a lot are called facts. And like, do you know what four plus three is? And do you know what five times eight is? And all that sort of stuff. Um, I will tell you that we still teach kids like all that stuff. Um, we still kid, want kids to know all that stuff. Um, I think the ways we teach, some of it has changed. But a lot of what we teach, especially in that area, has not changed. Um, these were the things I was just talking about, the facts. Um, I'm hoping everybody in the room feels confident that your kids are meeting all those things. Most of these are taught in the elementary grades at some point or other in different grades. Um, the ones that are called, the ones in the media are things like four times five. They are not things like 327 times 85. Um, they remain fundamental for the following reason. Um, being able to estimate is a hugely important life skill. So if you go to the store, you gotta know, is this like $40 or $400 or $90? That's important. And you can't estimate without facts. So if I said to you, this was $23 and this was $47, about how much is that? Do you get that you gotta be able to add like threes and fours and that sort of thing to do it? So facts are never gonna go away ever from math. They're always gonna be critical. Um, we used to believe that the best way to learn facts, and, and if some of you still believe this, I'm just telling you, don't, um, uh, that we used to believe that the best way to learn them was to like look at a piece of paper and like study them and memorize them and then have somebody like ask you questions like really fast to see if you know them. And I will tell you that for some kids, they still like that and it works for them. But there is a great amount of research that says for some kids, it pretty much kills them. And because of that way of doing it, their anxiety becomes so high that they actually cannot learn those facts. And there is brain research, and I'm actually gonna give you the name of a researcher um, in here. Oh, I'm doing things in a different order, but here it is. Her name is Sean Belloc, and if you're interested, you could Google her name. 
And what they're discovering is they've actually done brain scans of kids who are math anxious. Um, I'm betting that in this room there exist people who are what we call math anxious. You do not have to identify yourself. Um, there's some people who as soon as you say you're talking about math, it's like, you know, go away. I don't want to talk to you. It's all bad. Um, and one of the things that we know is math is one of the only subjects that creates this anxiety. Like I've never met anyone with social studies anxiety. Um, and so the idea is there was something that wasn't clicking for some people. And most of this research is showing us that that anxiety actually prevents you from performing. So now we use other approaches to help kids learn facts when those approaches that we used to use are not appropriate for them. Um, and we actually have labels for them, and one of the labels is strategies. And probably some of you have had kids come home and talk to you about strategies, and you're wondering, what are they talking about? That's what they're talking about. So I'm just going to tell you one quick story. I have kids. They're all grown up now. Um, and um, I lived in Fredericton, New Brunswick for a long time before I moved to Ottawa. And Fredericton is a little city. And I was a school trustee, which means people knew who you were. And I was a professor, and that means people know who you were. And I was a mom. And so this is what happened to me. Um, I was going to the parent-teacher night for my son um, when he was in grade three. And I had friends on the staff who told me that his teacher was very nervous about this interview because if you said to Aaron, um, how much is four times eight? If you said this to my Rebecca, how much is four times eight? She just says 32. But this is Aaron. I'll just be Aaron for a minute. If you said to Aaron, what is four times eight? It went like this. 32. So what he did is called using strategies. It was like before it was called that. In his head he was thinking, I don't know four times 32, I know two times 32. You know, like he was doing all these little pieces to get himself there and he got there. So the, the, the teacher was worried, because she didn't know me, that I would be upset. I'm a math person and my kid is like slow in math. And we all assume you're supposed to be fast in math and I don't know why we assume that, but we do. And she thought I'd be mad at her and so I was telling a bunch of parents the other night, I spent the whole interview calming her down and telling her how wonderful it was that he did that. And wasn't that so like amazingly cool? And she apparently thought it was amazingly cool. And everything was all good. He's a grown up now. And if you said now, what is four times eight? He would say 32. Okay. So the message is fast is not the game. Getting answers is the game. One way or another is the game. And different kids do learn it different ways. So that's some of what you're seeing with your kids. Um, he, one of the things that kids could learn is, hey, I don't have to memorize 4 plus 5 if I already know 5 plus 4. Like, that's a waste of energy. And so you want kids to know things like that. Um, this is a picture that you might see your little ones bring home to help you see why you really don't have to memorize 8 plus 3 if you know 8 plus 2. Do you see what I did? I took my three and filled something we call a ton frame. So if you know eight plus two is 10, eight plus three is like no work, one more. Say the next number. So I don't need a kid to like quickly say eight plus three is 11. I'm totally cool with them saying eight and two, 10, one, 11. We're totally happy with that. Um, we know that kids learn what we call doubles really fast. For some reason, this is like how our brains work. So kids will learn six plus six, five plus five, eight plus eight, like way faster than like four plus seven or any of those combos. So what teachers teach kids is something like this. If you had seven plus eight, don't sweat it. Think seven plus seven, you know that guy, and, and what? Add one, we're done. Is everybody cool with that? And so that kind of thinking. Um, this is a picture to show you that four fives, do you all see four groups of five? Is the same as five fours, turn your head. And your little guys probably come home and call that an array, because that's what we call it in school. And it's to help them see you don't have to learn both of those, one of them gives you both. This array with red colors and not red colors is meant to help you see that if you can't remember four sevens, you just say, do four fives. Do you see the four fives are black? And four twos, you see those are red. 
and you say 20 and 8, 28, I'm there. For some kids, that's the way they learn. And it's different than the kids who learn the other way. We are more aware in education now than we used to be that we can serve those differences better and achieve greater success with more students by serving those differences. Um, here is an example of how we use a, a, an addition table or a multiplication table to teach kids. Um, I'm sure you all remember this from your youth somewhere. Um, some kids are amazed. I started coloring a line of 11s. I just got tired. But do you see, like, all the 11s are on that line, like every 11. Well, that's sort of cool. And if you notice where those 11s come from, the bottom 11 is 9 and 2. The next 11 is 8 and 3. 9 got one littler. Two got one bigger. You with me on that? One littler, one bigger. One littler, one bigger. So if somebody asked you nine and two and you were having trouble, you'd make the nine a little bigger and the two a little littler, and there you are. So these are what we call the strategies that we're teaching kids. I'm not going to teach you all of them. I'm just going to show you a little one. You'll like this one. Um, that is what we call a multiplication table. They still exist. Um, look at my three blue rows. And just look up and down. What do you notice about the numbers that are up and down in, one of the, in those blue rows? The guy in the two row plus the guy in the five row is the guy in the seven row below. Do you follow that? Do you see that? That is code for, if you can't remember seven times something, just do five times and two times and add them. And like for some kids, it's like, oh, you mean that's all I have to do? And then everything like comes together for them, whereas when they were separately looking at all these little pieces, nothing was coming together for them. So we're finding new ways to bring things together for kids. Those are some of the ways. Um, we use things that are called manipulatives. Um, they are tactile things that kids can touch and feel and move. They're also visual things so that they can see pictures in their head. Um, this is usually used with younger kids. It's called a 10 frame. And what you see is if I were adding 9 and 9, do you see 9 red guys in the top and 9 in the bottom? Do you see how easy it is to move a guy from the bottom to the top? And 10 and 8 is super easy. Because 10 and 8 is almost like not an addition. It's what 18 is. So we use these tools to help kids see things better. Um, many of the tools, and this is why you might want to download it, are available freely as either apps or virtual manipulatives on, in, on websites. Um, I'm going to give you one place. I'll say it one more time so you don't have to write all those stupid web addresses down. You can download it and they'll all be there. Um, what I wanted you to see is what they look like. So if your kid comes home and says we use pattern blocks in school and you don't know what they're talking about, you could go here and you could actually, they could show you what they did. So this is called pattern blocks. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen these in doctor's offices. And what they are are tools that kids can use and it turns out, without getting into it all, that they're useful for geometry, they're useful for fractions, they're useful for angles, they're useful for a whack of stuff. Um, what I do as, an, as, a, as a user of the virtual manipulative is I click on one of those shapes and it goes in there and I move them around and I put them where I want and I see who goes together. Do you see right now I could teach a kid that the red is half of the yellow? by putting two reds on top of a yellow. I could tell him I am showing you one and a half yellows. I could teach them that means that's three halves because I could put three reds on it. Like there's a ton of good stuff that happens. None of these cost money, they're just like all there. Um, there are apps, if you, if you have iPads and things, you could Google for apps for pattern blocks and all these things and you would find them as well, except usually you have to pay a little money. Um, this is a hundreds chart. The numbers from 1 to 100 are there. I don't know if you can tell, but do you see up top it says count by? A kid could decide, I want to count by 2, and it will color all the things you would say if you counted by 2. But then you erase it and you say, I want to count by 5, and it will color all the things you say when you count by 5. So instead of a kid like spending an eternity like coloring each of these things, they can have this done and they can start looking for patterns in relationships. Um, these are called base 10 blocks. 
And what they are are hundreds and tens and ones that kids can do to show numbers, to add numbers, to subtract numbers, whatever. So do you see that I showed you the number 123? And it's because I clicked in things and put them there. I could show you whatever number I wanted. If I wanted to add 43, I would take four little 10 sticks and put them in, and three little one guys and put them in. So kids get to see what's going on when you do all the normal things you do. Um, there are even tools for older kids. These are called integer chips. So kids in grades seven and eight in Ontario learn about negative numbers, and we have these little positive chips and negative chips that help you learn the rules for how those guys work. So there's tons of these available. Um, a lot of them, you probably notice, started the same in the website. It said NVL, NLVM. That's called the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives, but the national is the US, but we get to use them. And um, what they are is if you go to that site, you'll see a zillion of these things, and you can see what they look like. These are fraction bars. Um, so fractions are kids' nemesis. Um, they may have been your nemesis too, I'm not sure. Um, and do you see that on this picture here, it might be hard to read, but the little yellow guys say a half on them, and the blue guy says seven fifths. If my question were how many halves are in seven fifths, I can look and see. So these are the kinds of tools that kids use at various levels. This one is more geometric. Um, one of the cool things about computers is that you can see animation. So what happens is if you click on that box, it folds down to look like that thing on the left. If you click on the thing on the left, it folds up to be a box. So you get to see what things look like when they flatten down and when they fold up. Um, so there's lots of those kinds of things. Um, one of the things I thought I would talk to you about is computation. Um, lots of people worry about their kids come home adding funny ways and multiplying funny ways and it makes you nervous. Um, and what I wanted to do is just share a little bit and not too much about them. Um, this is a way that a friend of mine who's a grade two teacher taught her kids to add small numbers, two digit numbers. So I am on a hundreds chart and I am adding 44 and 32. Do you see I started at 44, and what did I do? Down, 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 what does down, down, down do for you? You added 30, you with me on that? Down, 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 and then over, over. Every single kid in her class can add two digit numbers. It's kind of cool, like you can see it in your head for the rest of your life, so even if you close your eyes now, close your eyes, don't look. Okay, pretend you're on 35, go down, where are you? Just go down one from 35, 45. So if I said to you, we're on 35, add 22, you would say 45, 55, 56, 57. That's pretty cool. So we, that is a great way for kids to learn. You can actually also subtract. Um, this time, I'm subtracting 19 by going up, up, which means I subtracted 20. Oops, that was too much go over a guy. You know, so I'm shortcutting a lot of stuff, but I'm just showing you how some of these make like so much sense to kids. Instead of like funny little rules, like you put this there and you put a one up there and you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, Grown-ups actually do calculate differently. You just don't think about it. If I asked you to do the numbers that are there, almost everybody I know who's a grown-up would put them in columns and do this guy and this guy and this guy, and I probably would too. It's all good. If I asked you to do 200 minus 2, do you get that that would not be the smartest thing to do? You would probably do it a different way. So all we're doing is teaching kids, hey, you do things differently depending on what you got. So I want a kid to think 200 minus 2, 199, 198. Like, I really would prefer that than all that little crossing out stuff. Um, this is what you might see coming home. Um, kids are adding 38 and 47, and they're writing 70 and 15, and you're thinking, how come it goes on so, like, it's so long? But do you get that that's exactly what you do? Only you just write it in one line, because I guess they were conserving paper. 
And usually you start on the right, although for most kids it makes more sense to start on the left. So that kid is saying 30 and 40 is 70, 8 and 7 is 15, put them together. So they're not really doing anything different than you, it just like looks different on the piece of paper. Um, another way I, we want kids in the Ontario curriculum to think about 38 and 47 is to go like this. Don't break up the 38, like leave her alone, 38. 47 is an icky number. I don't like 47. I like 50. Are you cool with me? Can you do 38 and 50 in your head? 88. Oops, I added three too much. Go back. So those are the kinds of things. We're calling it mental math and where it's mental strategies. Um, I think you'll like this one. Um, when I was in school, and probably when you were in school, they taught you, you how to do all that crossing out stuff when there's all those zeros up top. So this is what I did instead. I said, well, if you're taking, if you had 100 cookies and somebody took 79, maybe they took the 79 from that pile of 99 cookies over there. Just don't forget the other cookie. Are you all cool with that? So do you see that if I did 99 minus 79, you are a happier camper? Don't forget the other cookie. Okay, so there, I've met kids who are like having so much difficulty with all that other stuff, and we're just giving them tools to not have all those difficulties. Um, this, by the way, and I, so probably the last one I'll teach you and then I'll skip to other stuff. This is um, a picture that does multiplication the way you learned it a long time ago, only it does it in a picture. So I believe that when you learn to do 25 times 44, somebody said do 4 times 5. My 4 times 5 is in the bottom corner over there. Then they told you to do 4 times 20. My 4 times 20 is on the right-hand side because it's 80. Are you cool? Then they told you to do 40 times 5, which is the 200 that's down there. And then they told you to do 40 times 20, only they said it was 4 times 2, but it's not 4 times 2, it's 40 times 20, and that's the 800. So all I did, this is the shortcut of it, I made a rectangle that was 25 by 44, because the area of a rectangle is multiplying. And then I broke it up into nice pieces and put the pieces together. I swear to you, and I'm not going to belabor it because we don't have enough time, this is exactly what you do. Okay. We'll leave it at that. You can study it later. Um, I think that you need to know that technologies that exist now are not going away. They're just going to get more sophisticated. And so the skills that my grandmother needed to survive are different than the skills your children need to survive. Um, everybody I know has some device that would get you calculation answers if you needed them. What we really need to know is whether the buttons you pressed were right, so does your answer make sense. So we're spending much more time on estimation because that's what our life is. We trust the cash register unless we thought it was $30 and they say it was $50. So that was estimating. If you thought it was $3402 and it said $3403, I have met a few people, but if you're behind them in line, you're not very happy, who will question that. Most of us like are happy, right? We believe the machine if it's in the ballpark. So we spend lots of time on estimating, and you can look later at some of the kinds of questions I would ask kids for estimation. Um, I'm, I'm picking and choosing what we're talking about because of time. I'll talk about things and come back if we have time. Um, helping out is, I mean, your parents, and you're here, and that means you have a mission to try to help your kids. Um, one of the things that I'll tell you is that helping my kids do better in math, um, we did a lot of what I will call math play. And what I mean by that is you're just like doing the dishes or you're getting ready to go to the car and you do like teeny little mathy kind of things. They aren't like, come on, we're going to sit down and getting serious. It's just like casual conversation so it feels like play. So this would be an example of something I would do with my kids. I'm going to do it with you. Okay, it's going to be magic. All right, so this is what you all have to do. Everyone in the room, you are going to um, choose a number. Um, you're going to have to do some calculations, so be wise about the number you choose. So you're just going to quietly choose a number. Then you're going to double it. Then you're going to add four. 
then you're going to double that number, whatever you just had said. Then you're going to add 8. And then you're going to divide by 4. I got you to do a lot of calculations. And what's going to happen now is you're going to give me your final answer. And I'm going to tell you what number you picked. Does everybody get how that's going to work? Okay. All right. See, even you're smiling. Like, kids are, like, excited now. Like, you're going to do this. All right. So I really do hope you did the calculations right. Otherwise, this really does not work. Okay. So somebody give me your final answer. Thir okay. So I heard her 13 first. And I'm thinking that maybe you started with 9. And she nodded, yes. 16? 12. His final answer is 12. I'm really counting on you now. Is 16? All right, we're not going to use him. All right, somebody else. <laughs> Her final answer is 9. I'm thinking she started with maybe 5. She said yes. Give me another final answer. 504. 504? Oh, my goodness. All right, and I think maybe she started with 500, and she said yes. Do you get that there's no kid who doesn't want to know now, like how you're doing this? Trying to figure it out. So this is just a little silly game, and what I'm doing is getting them to calculate and practice and try stuff, but it's fun. Fun is sort of the ticket, right? You know, it has to be kind of nice to do, and uh, my kids, my, my daughter does have a PhD in math, so it worked for her. Um, and so the deal is that it does, it, it's a kind of a nice little thing you could do. Now, I'm not going to go through it, but on the next slide, I'm actually going to show you how my trick worked. That's your homework to figure that out. Okay. Um, you can ask funny little, if you really want to know, I'll tell you after we're, we're done. Um, when one of the things that I think we can do is sometimes when parents are trying to help, like you'll go to a store like Scholar's Choice and you'll get like little workbooks for kids to do. And that's fine. But no kid is like super excited counting the stars on a workbook page. Like they'll do it, but it's not thrilling. But if I said to this kid, so how many spoons do you think there are in our entire house? Like look everywhere. How many spoons? That tends to be more thrilling. You know, like now you want to know like how many spoons are in your house. They do make a little bit of a mess like looking for the spoons. But the idea is they're motivated to count something real and interesting. It could be that they're counting how many steps there are between floors of houses. Is it usually 10 steps between floors, 4 steps between floors, 8 steps, and they find out and their friend finds out, like is it all the same? Those tend to be interesting for kids. It could be how many trees are on a typical street. Do you get that if you're in Alta Vista, it's different than if you're in a brand new neighborhood? But kids could talk about that. Um, sections in an orange, I don't know if you know this, but um, some people say every orange, big or small, has the same number of sections. And I'm buzzing. Some of you are actually going to go home now and check out some oranges. And that's what you want. Like, you want kids to, like, want to do it. You don't want them to do it because they're obeying you. You want them to want it. And so you have to do things differently to want them to want it. Math is not intrinsically. It's not like you read a story that made you happy. It's not that you're just curious about Saskatchewan and you find out about it. Math is something that you aren't going to be naturally curious about unless people help you be curious about it. And then you really can be. Um, but you have to get kids to that place. Um, I asked little questions in passing like this. The answer was 10. What do you think my question was? Do you get there's lots of possibilities? Like, these are just like in passing. So there's a lot of this kind of stuff you can look at later. Oh, this one is great. I have to tell you about the last one. Um, there is this hysterical YouTube video. Um, I didn't write the, the link there, but if you Googled 43 McNuggets, you would find it. And um, there is a British guy with a very cute little accent who goes to the McDonald's counter and he asks for exactly 43 McNuggets, like dead on 43. And it turns out with the pack combos that there are, you can't get 43. He kind of knew that. You can get 44. So he's talking to the girl and she says, well, can I give you 44? And he's saying, no, I need 43. Anyway, it's a very funny video. But essentially, it's a math problem, like what combos can you get and what combos can't you get? So that, like, stuff like that is fun. Um, support for your kids involves um, showing 
they, not showing them how to do stuff, but asking them questions. And it's really hard to do because we're adults and we're busy and we don't have time for all this, but um, if the kid just comes to you and you do it for them, two things happen. First of all, they never do it themselves. They always wait for you to do it for them. B, if you do it differently than their teacher did, all kind of chaos happens. So instead of that, we just say, like, show me what you did instead of I'll show you what to do. So I think that's an important issue. Um, I think asking why this and asking why that. So why'd you do this or would you do this? Or, do you think that feels right or those kinds of questions? Um, a lot of math is building connections between ideas. So if you notice something they're doing that was sort of like something they did another day, you say, I think that sounds sort of like the, to help them see those connections. Um, you can play games that you can completely make up that practice skills. Here's an example of a game I completely made up. You and your kid play, or two kids play, you each roll two dice, the score is your sum, all of you play that game, the first guy to 100 wins. Here is a more interesting version of the game. You roll two dice, but you get to double one of the numbers and leave the other one alone before you get your score. The first guy to 100 wins. Do you get there's a strategy here? Like you don't double the one. <laughs> but they might not know that in the beginning, but they watch you not double the one and they sort of clue in. So, there's games at various levels that bring in strategies. Um, there are board games. In this particular game called 24, you, pick, you get cards and you have to take the numbers that you get and somehow add stuff and subtract stuff and multiply stuff and whatever to get a 24 out of it. So you could use decks of cards. You don't have to buy a game. Um, there is a company in Edmonton um, that actually writes games for math teachers to use with kids. She has a million books, this is just one of them, and you could easily buy them as a parent as well. They're all skill practice games. Um, uh, they're at different levels. This one happens to be for grades K to three. They're not, they're on different topics. Um, they're cheap, they're like $5.99, stuff like that. So uh, if you're interested, that's a good source. Um, there are interesting problems kids could solve. When I was a little girl, I used to figure out what the letters of my name were worth, you know, that sort of thing. And I'm sure lots of you did. Here's a better version. Get me words that are worth between 40 and 50. You see that now I'm thinking a little harder. And what would a word be? And if I use a Y, for example, you don't have like a lot of latitude with your other letters, so where do you look? So there's kind of strategy and also kind of um, just practice. Um, there is an organization in the U.S. called Figure This, and they write problems for parents to do with their kids, and there's hundreds of them. I'm just going to show you one. So this one is, um, if a faucet drips every two seconds in one week, how much water goes to waste? Enough to fill a glass, a sink, or a bathtub. You know, and so this is not quick. You work with your kids to try to guess it. And they try to do problems that they think kids might be interested in. Most kids I've met really do care about the environment these days, and that would be of interest. Um, I've listed for you a whack of websites. Um, they're often government, but not all of them, which have information that is designed for parents, and so you might find some of these useful. Some are Ontario, some are other provinces, but the messages are very similar. The one in the middle is um, not a government website. It's a place in the Netherlands called the Freudenthal Institute, and they just have really cool stuff. So um, kids would just enjoy some of the activities that are on there, and that's why that's in the list. Um, I think it is important for your perspective to be that what I need from my, what I'm hoping for for my son or daughter in math is that they get it and their marks are good and they do well on tests and all that, but that they also like it. So if you have kids who hate it and have good marks, you do not have any success. Because what that kid who hates it gonna, is going to happen is there's a million careers they will not pursue because they'd have to do a math class. And so for me, I need a combo thereof. Is everybody okay with that? I did see you and I'll get back to you. Um, I want them to like see math around them, like notice stuff. 
I mean, my kids, like, they had me, so it did affect things. But really, like, if they see numbers, like, they think about them. Like, they say, like, look at mom, that license plate has 27 and 54. You know, like, they start seeing stuff around them. And that only happens if we create that environment where that does happen. Um, I think you should be encouraging kids to teach you what they learned instead of you trying to show them what you learned. Um, you need to show that you enjoy math too. Now this is difficult for people who don't. And if you don't, like be a good actor um, or actress, um, that what happens is we hear in schools every day kids who actually don't even try and they say, my mom's not good in math either. So if their mom is not good in math, that could be a, a reality. Mom, just don't tell your kid. Tell somebody else, but not your kid. Because it becomes an excuse for them not to even try. So it's critical that kids um, not hear you say that you don't like it, because that, it, it just causes all kinds of bad stuff. Um, so think about that as you talk to them. Um, show confidence that you can do things. So what I've learned not to do over time is when I'm working with my kid on a problem, I wouldn't say, oh yeah, that's hard because that's already like a downer. Do you know what I mean? Oh, I, instead I'll say, yep, yeah, we can do it. And we'll work on doing it. So kids are so sensitive to all these little nuances. And so showing confidence, showing positivity is a huge deal, um, more than you even realize. And it took me a long time of doing it wrong to figure out what I needed to do right. Third kid worked a little better. All right. Um, emphasize good thinking, not speed. I think I said to you earlier, there is some bizarre thing going on in the world where math is associated with being fast. There's no reason to be fast. You don't want to be like painfully slow, but you don't have to like beat the other guy and be faster. It shouldn't be about fast. It should be about understanding. Um, emphasize the good thinking, not the mistakes. It's really, this one, I was terrible. Um, when you see your kid do something wrong, your beeline is to what they did wrong. You kind of ignore like all the 10 things they did right. You beeline to what they did wrong. It's just human. Um, try not to when it's math. Just try to see all the good stuff they did and weave the little issues in. You don't ignore them, but you don't like focus in on them. Um, and it's actually a skill I, I, you can develop where you take something a kid does wrong and kind of turn it into right. So for example, if a kid did five plus eight and told me it was 14, which it's not, I say, yeah, I think 14 is five and nine. Let's do five and eight now as if like nothing ever happened. Do you understand what I'm saying? It just changes the dynamic. Um, this is the place where you can get all those slides with all those website addresses. So it does say, this is the one thing you'd have to write down. It says one to infinity, but two is T-W-O. And it's a dot C-A and not a dot com. And you are, there's a million things there. You're looking for something that says parents. Are we good with that? All right, now I kind of went at warp speed, which I just told you not to do, but in any case, um, are there questions you have? So did I see your hand? Yes. Okay, what was your question? So my son's in grade 10, uh, math next semester. All right. So out of the five strands, he's, oh, he's pretty good. He excels at geometry. Okay. Um, algebra is the, like, he just doesn't seem to get it. Okay. And algebra is my strongest suit. Okay. Having, yeah. One, yeah. So she's saying, for those of you who can't hear her, that her son is going to grade 10 and grade 10 math, and that he's strong in some strands, not others. Algebra is a problem for him. Um, clearly, if he can do other things, it's not that he's unable to. It's just this is the one that isn't coming quickly. Um, I think we all do have bents. I am, in fact, more algebraic than geometric. So when I have geometry, I have to work harder than when I have algebra. So we all do have these little bents. Um, one of the things I will tell you is that their teachers are being encouraged in high schools to use visual tools to help in algebra as well. So for example, if I, I, this may not mean anything to you right now, but do you remember that 25 times 44 picture I showed you that was a rectangle? Believe it or not, if I were trying to teach a kid how to factor x squared plus 2x plus 1, I would use the same visual. 
And I would say take a piece called an x squared, two little pieces called x's, and a one, and make a rectangle, and tell me how long and wide it is. So I can talk to you more, and I'm totally happy to. I am telling you they're actually visual tools, which if your kid is good in geometry, probably would be useful for that kid to help. So you might talk to a teacher and say, so my kid is good in geometry. I think it might help if we use some of those visual tools, that sort of thing. Um, there are kids. Geometry is extremely, I mean, algebra is extremely abstract for some kids. They need teachers to make it live. And so to make it live, there are both visual tools, there's other tools as well. Um, I do a zillion days of work every year with teachers, and what our focus is, is make it make sense. Don't just show them how to do stuff. So all I can say is you hope that's the teacher your kid gets. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. So maybe there's something wrong with IXL, not me. <laughs> okay, well, I, okay, so I have to tell you that I don't work for any school boards or ministries or whatever, so all you get to hear from me is what I think is right and wrong. Um, I don't actually think that there are, in, there, uh, there are some school board decisions that are big. There are many individual teacher decisions. So uh, one teacher might decide, this is the ticket, this would be great for my kids, whereas the classroom down the hall, they might do something else. Um, I can't control all teachers. All I can say is that if it were my class, um, that would not be what they were using. That's all I can say. All right, because I'm serious that speed is, I am, by the way, faster than like almost anybody I know at almost anything that's intellectual. And I still think that, that isn't the goal. That just happens to be, it works for me. I think the goal is understand it and some people take longer to process things, even to say things. Like I talk like that and I do like that, but that doesn't mean I think everybody should because I don't. Yep. Um, I think kids using your fingers is a beginning and you stop using your fingers when they're not useful to you anymore. So the kids who are doing this probably still need to see stuff. Um, if they had counters, they might not use their fingers, they, they'd use counters. But when I'm still trying to figure out what does three plus four like look like, having something to look at is helpful. Um, at some point, if they were 15 and still doing three plus four, I'm getting more nervous um, because at that point they need, they do need to have processed that part more quickly because they have so much more to deal with. So I think that some kids will need their fingers longer than other kids. I think different teachers have different attitudes. Um, I don't think I would discourage it from a really little kid. When I get a bigger one, I'm getting more nervous. Yep. Yep. Um, not, well, no, I think, there's, I think certain kids' personalities like different things than others. So I actually talk to teachers, like I do work with teachers pretty much every day. Um, so one of my little lectures to them is the following. Whoever you are, be somebody different some of the time. So what I mean by this is, if you are super structured, there are kids who are going to love that. They want you to be super structured. They hate it when you go kind of like wild and crazy, and those days are for them. But there's also kids who don't do well in this kind of place, and they need a little bit, uh, I don't mean wild and crazy, but like more thoughtful, more unusual, more out of the box. They have to have their days too. I believe that uh, overall, um, there are issues about how boys perform in schools. I think that schools are too structured for many boys. 
and so for those boys, I need those other days. I think a lot of girls are happier with structure, but I don't think it's universal. So I do think there are girls who like those other crazy things, and there's boys who like the structured things. So I don't think it's about gender per se. I do think it's about personality, and I really, really believe that some kids wish you just like, tell me what to do, tell me what to do, tell me what to do. And some kids really want to think hard, and that they both have to happen in a classroom on different days. Like, I really do believe that. Anything else? Our time is pretty good, Kathy. Okay. Thank you, Marian. I think in some ways math is the four letter word right now, and I've seen it bring kids to tears, and I've seen it bring parents to tears. Um, so it's really nice to have this opportunity to get some common sense approaches to things, perhaps, to help us understand. Because, you know, all these strands and stuff, I don't know about you, but we certainly didn't talk about them when I was in school. And, you know, that opportunity to use the math words with our kids and to remember they're, that they're important, it's not just the answer, it's the sum or the difference. We have to show them how we use it and where we use it. And we have to deal with that part of being a parent when you see your child struggling and know that there is help and we need to support them. So thank you. Good. It's great to have okay. you here Good. this morning. Okay. Okay.